All right, looks like we're on. Uh, obviously, you know who this dumb face is. Uh, you know who that beautiful face is. Uh, Puzzlebox, aka Dallas. Uh, me from my Connoisseur's Ventures, Dallas from his Common Theory podcast. I'll put a link in the description uh, to let you guys be able to go and experience that. In fact, I think uh, at the time of this recording, we're around the, uh, the uh, time when a interview, not interview, a debate, um, some sort of podcast uh, where they uh, humbled me enough to bring me on and we talked about a thing or two, uh, very spiritedly, I think. In a fun and uh, engaging and respectful way, which I, uh, the reason why I'm pointing to this on my end, I always take the things that I say as just, you know, people, you know, uh, or as a dumb guy on the internet saying dumb things. Uh, but where, and I think Dallas and both Chris will agree, is that um, there needs to be opportunity for us to engage in spirited, respectful debate where we don't always agree on the back end, but we're able to, to, to talk about our ideas and all of that in a way uh, that we can potentially learn something from each other. And you never know. I mean, my opinion might change. Their opinion might change. You, you never really know what the outcome is going to be. So. Put, I'll put that link in the description. Uh, go check out Dallas and Chris's uh, podcast. It's phenomenal. They've got uh, other works in the pipeline, too, so plenty of content to come. As for me, you, you know where the stuff comes. It comes weekly on the website. All right, let's, let's get into this. So this, uh, the reason why you don't see Jonathan on the screen is uh, uh, basically an oversight on my part. Uh, uh, he'll bring. I'll probably bring him in in uh, in a month or so, or what have you, as we do uh, uh, quarter two roundup. Uh, just kind of seeing where we are post uh, RIW event, that sort of thing. Uh, essentially, we're at the time of this recording. We're a week away from RIW, and uh, I wanted to put some information out uh, based on the stats that we've seen in the in the previous six months, uh, especially with one major tournament uh in the year you know already happened and kind of get some information out there to the folks um maybe it'll help you prep for uh, raw next week maybe it won't uh maybe you're metagaming for uh, another sanctuary event because i know bobby had made intention uh, uh for one in the following month in july so if this helps you in some way kind of uh ascertain what the meta is, what people are doing, especially in light of these tournaments that are happening, because uh, I think the data reflects that. Uh, if this helps you, you know, that's that's the intention. Uh, otherwise, if you just like seeing our beautiful faces, you know, on the screen, well, you're in for a treat. <laughs> so, uh, with that intro, Dallas, you got anything you want to add before we transition over into the data? I think we're good to start up here. Sweet, a simple man. I will hit the other. Okay. So what you're going to see on your screen uh, at first is the website. Uh, obviously, I have been pushing uh, development on the website tremendously in the last month or so. been working with uh, developers. This one knows how to play Magic, but is not really a Magic dev. So that insight... Uh, on the back end has been enlightening because he's he's asking me questions like you know why you're doing it this way why you're reporting it that way and in that moment I'm having to defend my thesis and he's giving me good ideas and some of that uh, uh, born of that I've I've also had requests on the front end from customers as it were uh, asking for player related data what have you speaking with the dev on the back end we actually made that happen in the last week so. That's that's more we can get into at a later time, but just I wanted to showcase that the things that we're going to be talking about um, now, Bodarn uh, has has gone through and, and, and created his own in-depth analysis in his own methodology and and that sort of thing. So he's he's distilled this information into a report, which you are going to see, which is going to be available via link in the description of this video. Uh, so you're going to see this output that he has created with his own uh, analysis. 
Um, both myself and Dallas have read through this, uh, uh, and I'll be reading through it more deeply, you know, as we go along too, because we're going to have hot and cold takes related to that. But just to kind of showcase that uh, in the website, there is a new functionality where you can filter by date range, all of that. We're going to be studying quarter one versus quarter two of 2023. Uh, that'll be possible for you to kind of glean your own information on the end via the website. That's all I wanted to do. We can talk uh, features and all that stuff at a later time. So let's see. Let's make that go away. Okay. So now what you see on the screen is uh, black and white, uh, an inverse. I did it for your, your eyes. You're welcome. Uh, an inverse view of the, uh, the data text sheet txt uh, file that you're going to find in the description below. This was produced by uh, Bodarn. And as it uh, says right here, Data Wizard, he's the data wizard for the site. Um, it's very, very interesting information. Uh, I highly suggest because we've glanced over it. I've glanced over it three times. I, I can't speak for Dallas here. Uh, every time I look through it, I find something new. So that's one reason why I want to provide the file for you so you can actually see uh, what's, you know, what we're talking about as we're talking about the thing. Okay, so here we are. I assume Dallas has got the uh, uh, the file up. Read through. Yeah. Right. So, uh, what I find interesting about Bodarn's uh, uh, analysis here is he goes in immediately right up front, bottom line up front. Chris will appreciate that. Um, he goes through and defines how he's interpreting things. So uh, and also discusses the purpose of the document itself. Like this first line that I'm kind of uh, stuck on right here, this document is statistical, not predictive. So it summarizes past events and does not predict future events. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about uh, in my own mind's eye. If you know anything about me uh, from our discussions, what have you, um, uh, I spent a lot of my adult life studying humans either for the government or as an anthropologist, a card-carrying member of that, that group. Um, I started this venture specifically from that perspective. Uh, it's never meant to uh, tell us what we're going to be doing or what you can expect from a certain circumstance. Um, there is some, you know, historians will tell you there is some predictability in, in the human endeavor because well, we're humans and we're uh, all subject to the same fallacy over and over and over again. So you'll hear that in comparisons to uh, the U.S. and ancient Rome, but I digress. Um, so looking at this, you know, Clay and Dallas are never going to say, at least I hope we're never going to say, you know, X, Y, Z. OK, that happened. So then you can expect A, B, C. I mean, there's a likelihood, potential likelihood for that but it's never a guaranteed thing so if you're uh, you <laughs> if you're using our advice to invest in stocks first off shame on you <laughs> but that that goes to illustrate that uh uh some would consider us to be experts in the field sure i'll take it uh that's also a, a thing that i never claim uh i want to be an expert in the field I will pursue that endeavor, I will study, I will work at it, but I'll never claim to be that. And by uh, Dallas nodding his head, uh, he shares that sentiment as well. You know, So uh, take what we say, if it helps, it helps. If not, not liable. <laughs> yeah, this does not constitute as legal advice. This is merely <laughs> our opinion on data for what has already happened. <laughs> exactly. And uh, even Bodarn says that please form your own conclusion. So with that, uh, he goes in and talks about winningness. And that is a, a very helpful uh, uh, descriptor for what you're seeing on the website as far as uh, uh, the, the, the statistical spread between the various archetypes and the various colors. You know, there's a graph there that shows you know, uh, basically an array of going from the winningest to one side and the least winningness, you know, down the, down the scale. Okay. And he goes in and explains exactly what that means. 
we don't have to spend too much time on that because uh, he does a good job explaining uh, exactly that concept. So if you want to learn exactly how uh, that stuff is interpreted, please. Like he's he's the expert in that. He's the school educated guy. I'm just a a guy reading his words. Um, we do in this literature use fringe uh, as a terminology. Uh, I think both. Uh, Dallas and I will agree on the fact that the fringe is an interesting word uh, socially. So from, from the data perspective, uh, he's literally talking about fringe from like what's on the edge. So the yeah, physical yeah. definition of the word fringe. <laughs> yeah. So by all means, please don't, uh, don't get tilted uh, by the use of the word. He goes and talks about uh, what meta decks are, what fringe decks are, what those relationships are statistically, and uh, helps you, you know, define what that looks like in the data. Excellent. Once again, you got to read through this stuff. Uh, if you like, if you like what he's doing in the dot guide server, you know, tag Bodarn and tell him he's a great guy. I mean, he is. You should do that anyway. But uh, so basically, that a little context on how to submit games, which uh, right now is true, but. Uh, uh, will probably change here in the future once I figure out how to do this auto-populating form. Um, okay. All right. It looks like we can get down into... Okay, so we'll briefly touch the first quarter. Uh, I'm not exactly sure um, what items Dallas wants to talk about. So with that, because I've blabbed my head off for the last few seconds, minutes, uh, I'll turn it over to my man Dallas here to do a recap on uh, the first quarter. All your sir. All righty. So first quarter, January to March of 2023. If we just take a look at some of the initial commanders, we see, of course, Gretchen, a bunch of games and a pretty good win percentage, 18 games, 61% win. Scholar of the Ages also performed pretty well, as did TPI, which are all blue decks, blue combo decks, except TPI doesn't usually play combo, so Gretchen and Scholar are blue combo decks. We see TPI generally more of a control mid-range deck. Uh, Wither Bloom is our first black deck to show up in the meta share. And that's Jonathan, with- right? I'm not sure who's been playing it recently. Has it been Jonathan? I played one game against Jonathan with this, so my assumption is because I see him one time, that's that's he's the one doing all of the things. This is why I'm an idiot on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't seen... I didn't see the deck at all this year, I don't think, so mm. I don't know who's playing it, but... Yeah, 10 games with a 50% win rate, which is obviously pretty solid. And then we see some more of, you know, the kinds of decks that are pretty popular. Gut Leader, Crackling Drake is one that's interesting. I didn't see that one much either, personally, but apparently I, it was seen. Play. I've played that a couple of times myself. And then Viscopa, which is a deck that I personally think is still pretty strong, but that's for later. Mm-hmm. Uh, Real Surreal, the mid-range Demir Queen. Malcolm Kettis and Weavers all doing pretty well during last quarter, which for the most part I think is to be expected. These are decks that are strong. Most of these decks, if not all of them, are historically very strong. So it's not too surprising that they're meta to me. Well, and that's and uh, then, that's a that's a great feature. Um one concern that we had last year was uh, in the evolution of the data and what have you, would would the data uh, suffer from uh, the, the perpetual magic players like move, wanting want to move to the next great thing and whether or not uh, some of these older decks would remain, would, would they be orphaned or would they remain uh, strong? So uh, this kind of like a, to circle back, a year later, even though we didn't have anything recorded at that time, uh, those discussions, like our fears have been allayed because, you know, uh, um, 
Witherbloom, Crackling Drake, Viscopa, uh, Rilsa Rail started last summer, correct? Yeah. And then Lore Weaver, Lay Weaver. So, still good. Turns out. Okay, please continue. <laughs> yeah, so worth noting, we are talking like six, three to six months ago for quarter one. So this isn't like recent, recent. Um, I know Gretchen had been a deck for like two, three months on my end at this point. But yeah, a lot of these decks are just have been around for such a long time. Wither Bloom, Crackling Drake, Weavers, Malcolm Variants have all been in existence for a long, long time. But if we move on to fringe decks, uh, here's where you see a bit more of the uh, newer stuff at the time. Uh, things like Dargo Kellogg, which hadn't really been popping up until this point. Abdel was. Abdel obviously existed as soon as he came out. Everyone was like, wow, this is strong. And then a lot of people dropped him because he just got hated out of the game a lot, which was kind of sad to see, but started picking up some traction again here. Well, it's also important to note, too, that uh, this captures January through the end of March. And I can't. I can't remember exactly when the Sanctuary uh, PDH events were announced, what day that was, uh, but I likely suspect that uh, this is capturing some of that playtesting. Uh, I vaguely recall, like the Abdel, uh, the Abdel deck here, uh, I vaguely recall Gator putting in, Chris putting in some uh, heavy playtesting uh, leading up to that. Uh, it's funny, uh, if, in case you didn't know it by now, he wasn't, or you, were intended to play in that tournament. Uh, so a lot of this playtesting was basically uh, to help others. I want to illustrate that. So uh, Gator was playing a lot of decks to, against other people to get used to. He was coaching, he was mentoring. He was, he was uh, basically showing people uh, a very strong deck to play against so that way they could practice their own lists. So uh, there were some... There were some uh, artifacts of that activity in this data at this time as well so for sure and that's part of the reason like gretchen is so high i was jamming games with people and other people were trying to pick the deck up as well um we see composite golem is an interesting one i know i played that a bit jonathan played it a bit uh bobby b fine played it some I'm not sure if anyone else did but we were all kind of messing around with this at this time, just because, you know, it's five color. Got to have something going on. Mm -hmm. um, Dina is an interesting one. Uh, seeing Dina here while Witherbloom is in the meta is interesting to me. They're only two games apart, but they're decks that look very similar from the outside to me. Uh, I don't play either of them. So to me, they look like very similar decks. Uh, Dina just has a bit more of a Voltron aspect to it. But, uh, we've got the uh, Elisil Core, which is kind of the Aristocrats deck of the format mm. at the time. I don't know much about it. Yeah, um, it's pretty much uh, make tokens, make death triggers, Kind of what you'd expect. Is a lot Orzov? of people were messing around with that. Yeah, Orzov. Okay. It's the uh, it's the Soul Sister on ETB, and then I think on Death Triggers, it makes opponents lose life. So it had longevity and that stuff. Mm -hmm. Which, as we're finding uh, as the meta continues, that these global uh, ping effects are quite strong. They certainly can be. One thing that's interesting to me down here that I want to point out is the decks that have over the game number threshold of 10, but their win rate is just a bit too low to be in the meta share. Uh, those being Is It Guild Mage, Tatiova, uh, 5 cost Tatiova, and Gut Iron Throne. Mm -hmm. Because these are. 
I guess not necessarily gut Iron Throne. That one's a bit more what I would consider the fringe. But is it Guild Mage and Tatiova are two decks that are very historically strong and have performed very well, especially in older metas. Mm. And obviously they're still doing well. They're doing well enough to be classified as fringe. But it could be a question of what in that meta was making them struggle a bit more than how they used to. So I uh, had to giggle a little bit because uh, uh, you, I, and uh, a couple other people have been hardcore engaging in the CPH for almost two years now. And uh, actually two years, about, yeah, yeah. Uh, so just to utter the phrase, uh, Tatiova is fringe, is kind of like, it invokes... It invokes a little feeling, you know, when you say that. But also, I think you qualified uh, that really well by saying um, you never know what the pod composition is where Tatiova, where Is a Gilmage are sitting, uh, that uh, the reason why they're struggling in that particular, you know, circumstance. So I think, I think that's uh, appropriately the key when looking at these fringe decks is, you know, what. Was it player skill? Was it pod composition? What other external factors outside of the, the deck construction itself uh, led up to these events? Which, by and large, um, if I was creating a library of, uh, of decks, then <laughs> I, I would still consider uh, everything that's fringe here as being part of the group. Because, I mean, st statistically, the delta between this is you know, too negligible to account for, you know, the things that I was saying, for, you know, the pod composition, the player skill, that sort of thing. So that's my yeah. my hot take. Yeah, we don't have thousands of games every month coming in, unfortunately. That would be awesome if we did, but mm -hmm. yeah, currently the data is still take it or leave, and it's just a, a minor indicator at best. Well, it's all we got. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. So where are we at here uh, in archetypes? Yep. Now we move on to archetypes. So once again, if you don't know what the definition of winningness is in this context, go up, read the document, or go back to the start where we talk about it a little bit. Basically, it's just the difference between how often it's actually winning games versus how often it's played. So at the very top in both well, I guess not in both. At the very top in winning percentages is combo at 24 percentage of the popularity. And control is also doing exactly pretty much exactly as well as you would expect it to based on its meta share of 6.7%. So control, not very widespread, not very represented, but holding its own. Mid range was extremely well represented at 36.6 percentage, but it wasn't winning quite as many games as you would expect. And same with aggro being 32 percentage and still having a negative winningness percentage. So Combo was really just winning games pretty frequently. A lot of combo decks in the meta that were able to hold their own. Um, and the density of mid-range and aggro can also kind of support that in different ways, depending on what pod compositions are and mm -hmm. all of that jazz, as per usual. Mm -hmm. um, part of that winningness percentage could come from being the only combo deck at a pod of two mid range and an aggro deck. And if you manage to win that, then that'll affect the percentages pretty well for combo and all that jazz. But and also for context, you know, circling back to that, uh, we're in, we're unsure exactly the impact of the preparation stage for the tournaments, how much that played into this. Um, uh, after uh, the postmortem on the uh, the sanctuary tournament. Uh, actually, I think it was given by uh, uh, Dallas here. Um, time was a consideration, so 
uh, because people were worried about time, they were less likely to bring a non-combo deck into the uh, tournament. So if they're, which lends to the possibility of there being an over-representation, you know, for that, especially in preparation and execution, because the uh, the the thing the, uh, the tournament was actually in May, and that'll be captured in the next uh, the next quarter as we get to that. Uh, but still, this there's, a, there's a, this lead up period where uh, people are less likely. If you're if you're the only aggro deck at a uh, you know double combo mid range pod, yeah, yeah, that's uh, something I'll definitely want to look at and talk about is the difference between the percentage played for combo between this quarter and the next one. Because as we can see, combo is still the third most popular archetype out of the four that we have mm -hmm. during this quarter. So even with preparation for tournament and all that, it's still not the most popular mm -hmm. archetype in our records. And then if we move on to colors, we see Boros is the most winning. Um, this is likely just due to decks like Gut Inspiring Leader being so good but not representing a large meta share. So they win a lot, a disproportionate amount of games. And obviously the deck is strong. I'm not discrediting Boros at all. But there's some uh, fluctuation yeah. there just can, due to... You can share. tell us your feelings on stacks later. <laughs> <laughs> Show me a Boros stacks deck. Um... <laughs> Then we've got uh, some other more combo-oriented colors, which are doing well, which kind of uh, justifies the high winning percentage mm -hmm. of combo decks. We've got Is It and Simic, which are both very classically combo-oriented color combinations, doing well in the meta. And then Orzov and Green are doing decent. Um, I'm not really sure what mono green decks we're seeing play, I but think I assume it's just a few I, games here and there. I think that's all Derek, if I was to guess. Uh, yeah. Derek, Derek uh, one, oh, of the, one, of the RC, Druid, right? yeah, one of the RC members has been uh, on a lot of games recently where he's jamming uh, Hermit Druid, and uh, the deck is extremely explosive, so uh, there's the opportunity for it to perform uh, pretty decently at a uh, depending on the meta uh, the, the the pod co composition. Uh, you know he's been he won a game against me so. <laughs> and then yeah, uh, Wuberg is five color being represented and winning a decent amount. Mm -hmm. This is pretty much just composite golem. If I had to guess, I don't think many five color decks get played. So. And we saw Composite Golem popping up in the uh, in the fringe category. So I assume that's where most of those games come from. And then if we look at some of the uh, losing archetypes, one that really sticks out to me is Rakdos being at the worst color combination while having a very high percentage of popularity, 10%, the second most popular color combination on this list. And it was not doing well, which kind of makes sense to me based on the popularity of archetypes. I think Rakdos typically does pretty well against combo decks. Mm -hmm. While combo decks were a good chunk of the meta, they were by no means dominating the popularity of the meta. And Demir also not performing well uh, sticks out to me. Because this is before tournaments, uh, before the Mystic Sanctuary tournament. So I don't expect Demir to get a lot of play mm -hmm. in preparation for tournaments or any of that, because I think a lot of the Demir decks are relatively slow. Same with Rakdos, actually. Mm -hmm. But they were getting way more play than I expected them to. And still not doing great 
even without playing with a time limit, which sticks was, out to me. I was trying to think of a uh, so Rissa Rail is probably the most common Demir deck. I know some people were uh, uh, jamming toast, so Ghost uh, Tormod. Yep, um, Armix as your. Okay, okay, is one that sees a bit of play, but not very much. And all uh, of those decks, uh, uh, as you uh, appropriately mentioned, uh, have some have access to great engines, e.g., the Initiative or uh, Tormod Ghost with its uh, uh, ability to cycle and make tokens and that sort of thing. Uh, it's just the timing of that game plan. Like you're really looking at, you know, turn seven, turn eight, turn nine you actually get turned on and activated which may have a temporal factor when it comes to 95 minute rounds in a in a tournament you know that sort of thing so yeah uh demir demir um i mean it's built a uh yeah demir demir is fun to play around with so i can understand everyone's excitement yeah it's like to me demir has some of if not the best cards for building in the 99 in the format, if you're playing two colors. Um, in my opinion, it's probably either Demir or Is It. Um, I practice, you can make an argument for. I just love the Grixis yeah. shell in general, and I think they're all really strong. But I think a lot of the Demir commanders themselves don't really lend themselves to winning quickly. Or they want to play those slower combo decks because they get access to all of those transmute cards, which are three mana sorcery speed to search your deck. And you well, want to do that multiple times. Yeah, five and six mana a pop, right? Yeah, so it, it, it really lends itself to slower game plans most of the time. But yeah, those are the, uh, the major things that I wanted to point out from here. Anything else from you? No, I uh, I don't get wrapped up too much in uh, the color stuff uh, yet, and the reason why is uh, I've been watching the meta go through these cycles, and um, some of sometimes those cycles are color attributed, like uh, uh, discovering what's strong in the Boris color pairing and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, while that might excite other folks, uh, like. Some people are uh, hell bent on on pushing the the, the mono white or white X uh, brand. Uh, it it doesn't. I'm I'm more archetype interested, and I I, I want to see how the balance shifts between uh, combo control. You know, we've added. Speaking of stacks, we've added uh, stacks as an archetype uh, 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 option for submitting data. Uh, Voltron still in there. So between those uh, six items there, uh, the main reason why uh, Stacks was added, just to kind of touch on that point really quick, is we we finally have kind of a, a central group of people that are working on like fleshing out what that means for CPDH. Now I do the I do the bunny years air quotes because uh, uh, there's a tension in the community right now. Tension in the community right now that uh, discusses what traditional stacks looks like versus what stacks looks like in uh, CPDH. Uh, that 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 debate isn't settled. Is that the polite way to say that? <laughs> yeah, that's fair, <that's> right? <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. Like, um, uh, what Dallas and I can agree on in that perspective is that we gain more by encouraging people to explore than we do by shutting people down. And if, if anything has been constant over you know, the last two years, especially where we're concerned, it's been, you know, like, bring it to the battlefield. You know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. There's been plenty of things that I've built that have failed. There's been maybe one or two things that he's built that's failed. Uh, he's got a better... <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got a big <laughs> list of decks that were not good. Um... So, I mean, but yeah, it's the, we have to make the attempt. and. Uh, to that end, that's the reason why uh, Voltron and Stax as archetype uh, identifiers uh, still remain in the data, is giving the people the opportunity to 
explore those areas. Now, that's the thing. A year from now, if that stacks column is, you know, down, down, poo poo, uh, we'll keep it. We'll definitely keep it as an option for viewing. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things. We'll be able to definitively show that we have tried everything that we possibly can. And this is where it ranks. So, uh, yeah, that's the reason for that. So, yeah, back, I don't get excited about colors. So, there's that. And I think that that's the end of uh, quarter one. So, quarter yeah. two, quarter two is not complete. Uh, to kind of go back up to the top here, I want to point out a number. So, in this uh, quarter one, it says N equals 209. So let's keep in mind that that's 209 games uh, played in three complete months. Whereas quarter two, scrolling down here to quarter two, uh, quarter two is from April, May, June. So it doesn't uh, capture all of June yet. So the in uh, so the, the 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 112 games that are logged uh, aren't equivalent you know, to the 209 games from those three complete months. So we're working with incomplete data, but we're doing so, once again, to circle back to the uh, beginning of this, uh, trying to preface this tournament season as we're engaging in it, try trying to inform and, I don't want to say educate, because that sounds too demeaning, but, you know, give people the opportunity to take what we're seeing and glean some of their own intelligence off of it, their own information off of it. So. I did want to point out that 209 does not equal 112 because that's relevant. So, okay. The meta for quarter two. Take it away, my man. Uh, you want me to leave this one to you? All righty. Oh, you're, you're, wow. you're doing it because, uh, okay, so uh, I'll qualify and quantify that. So uh, during this period in time, Clay was super busy with work. So... Uh, I was I was basically just touching the spinning plate as it was coming back around. Uh, Dallas had the opportunity, or better opportunity, to be more engaged with the meta as uh, as it was developing throughout this year. So uh, this is me deferring to expertise. Go ahead. Steve. That's fair enough. So uh, at the top of the meta, with twenty games played at a seventy five percent win rate, it's Abdel Sword Coast. Surprise. Uh, yeah, this is the deck that took down the Mystic Sanctuary tournament. Gator was playing this game into the ground, this deck into the ground uh, for a fair bit. He's been playing it after the tournament as well, a little bit, but nowhere near as much as leading up to the tournament, obviously. Mm -hmm. And a couple other people have also started to pick up the deck, uh, especially after the Sanctuary tournament trying to uh, pick it up and figure out how it works, be it for their own almost, reasons or... <laughs> almost what happened to Gretchen after it took down a, uh, a budget uh, CDH tournament. Right? Yeah, and then, and then Bobby won that tournament, which I think was during the, uh, the first quarter, which yeah. is probably something we should have mentioned, but we didn't. Um, we got it now. Good job, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then another deck doing really well that I think is very strong in the meta currently is a loyal subordinate with 15 games and 46 percent win rate uh this is mono black aggro it's very powerful um being able to play the black rituals and ritual out a commander that deals three to the entire table so nine damage a turn putting that down on turn one or two is just really strong and it's immune to some of the black removal, which is really nice as well. And it's been seeing a lot of play recently. Mm -hmm. um, Color of the Ages, another deck that was on our last report in the meta share. Still doing pretty well. 10 games, 40% win rate. It's still mono blue combo. It's pretty consistent. Um, we'll have to take a look at archetypes later. Uh, to come back to this deck and why it does well in my opinion, but that's one to talk about. Um, we have Malcolm Rograk, which is uh, Turbo Malcolm. Jonathan is the main pilot of the deck, although there might have been some other people picking it up recently. I know there's been some talk about it 
in some of the servers. Um, just a really fast variant trying to push Malcolm out as fast as possible. Avalanche Caller, we've got Mono Blue uh, Land Animator Calmo in the meta share doing well. So two Mono Blue decks up here and a Mono Black deck. So three Mono Color decks up in the uh, meta share, which is worth noting. I think that'll um, play into, um, there's a uh, there's a number coming up that talks of, or that discusses uh, average number of turns. And I think that the prevalence in monocolored decks in this order are contributing to that because you don't have to uh, play the ETB tap lands to fix your mana. So, absolutely. Put a pin in that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about my thoughts on that later as well. But uh, we've got another Malcolm deck in the top cut of the meta as well Malcolm Dargo, uh, Clay, thank you very much. Uh, Ted Games, 30% win rate, and Gut Inspiring Leader is still up here mm -hmm. with uh, 21 games played, so it's still getting its games in. Um, it's just barely over the win percentage threshold, but it is still up in the meta share doing well. So yeah. um, Down in the fringe, we still have Tatiova down here in the fringe category. It's just, it, this time it's doing very well. 50% win rate, it's just not seeing enough play currently. Right. Which is different from last time where it was seeing a lot of play, but didn't quite hit the win percentage mark. Mm -hmm. um, Malcolm Breaches, nine games, uh, just under the game, or I guess it's only eight games for this one, so it does hit the games played, mm -hmm. but it doesn't quite have the win rate by 0.1%. Um, I think this deck's phenomenal. I play this deck a lot, but so does B Fine Bobby. We play a lot of the same decks. Um, Parcel Beast down here with 11 games played, still not quite hitting the win percentage, and everything underneath that is also not winning enough to be in the meta, as well as not having enough games played. So a lot of those decks are what I would very much consider fringe, just because they don't see much play currently. Um, Parcel Beast and Malcolm Breaches are more decks that I would, I would tend to call them meta just because of how many games people play them yeah, in. Outside of the uh, outside of the the quarter snapshot, uh, if we look at the last year or six months. You know, for Parcel Beast and Tatiova, those numbers change, right? Right. So, so yeah, in this, in this, uh, to be clear, in this like small, not even finished quarter, uh, yeah, right now, this is where these are kind of panning out. So it's a very uh, uh, finite view that we're talking. Yeah. About. So if you play any of these fringe decks, uh, feel free to jam some more games and try to get them up into the meta share by the end of the quarter. That'd be and that's, cool a, uh, and that's the thing. That's a great point. So uh, part of the fallacy of the data is an overrepresentation of uh, people playing games and what have you, but like uh, with these specific decks. Uh, but I, I think that's actually a wonderful attribute of the data at the moment is that uh, if you see a deck that you think should be performing better, then you have the opportunity to, you know, change the fate, right? So you can actually get in and jam these games and uh, uh, change the, the data share, right? So. Yeah, find out. Or tell us that the deck actually is bad and <laughs> it, there's a reason it's not winning, which is also very valuable data to have. Yeah. So, yeah. it. Um, yeah, yeah, my feelings aren't hurt by this, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah. Types? Um, yep, let's move on to archetypes. Let's We've see. got combo Jumping up, spiking in popularity. Surprise. Uh, Mystic Sanctuary happens. Uh, more tournaments are being announced. And coming up, we've got Detroit. another tournament coming up this coming week, right? Yep. Or is it this week or whatever? Yeah, I, I, I started jamming that uh, Malcolm Dargo deck, uh, in, which is classified as combo, intentionally for uh, practicing for Sanctuary, practicing for RIW, because that's what I'm going to be playing there. Uh, so, like, even in my own games, I'm overrepresenting uh, combo 
uh, whereas I have uh, uh, a wide array of decks available to me. You know, I'm just specifically playing this one deck. So, yeah. So two tournaments in this quarter, uh, two big tournaments this quarter that were talked about. So that's going to spike combo popularity, um, and it is winning. So even though it's popularity has shot up, its win rate has actually improved uh, compared to its popularity from quarter one. So combo is I think it's pretty pretty accurate to say combo is strong in our format. Um, every other archetype listed is underperforming compared to its popularity. Um, control mid-range and aggro. Uh, aggro being the second most popular archetype, but having the worst win rate by comparison. And the other two coming up behind control, um, notably, actually got less popular, which tracks based on time. the time constraints, but it is also winning less, mm -hmm. which is interesting considering the spike in combo. Um, well, it do you think that uh, based on what you're seeing here on screen, do you think that the, the general consensus within the community is that aggro is actually the hedge against combo, uh, which is why we show as as combo increases, uh, the, the meta share for aggro increases. Uh, do you think that's a, an appropriate correlation that, you know, aggro is the hedge to combo or is mid range really the hedge to combo and it's just not being reflected so man that's really tough to say because i think a lot of those depend on what combo deck it is specifically for our format mm -hmm. um i think some combo decks like scholar of the ages are really poor at defending themselves from the aggro decks and i think aggro is a good answer to decks like scholar of the ages mm -hmm. whereas some other combo decks like Gretchen or Malcolm with Red, Roger, yeah. yeah, have either a game plan that is fast enough to win before the aggro decks can kill them, in which case it forces the aggro deck to try to take out other players first, and then once they've built up enough of a board state to turn to those combo decks and just knock them out afterwards and hope the combo deck doesn't win first, because you can't outpace them, or they have, you know, a 0 4 blocker in the command zone and a fog and life gain and Mystic Sanctuary to get those back and all of these tools against aggro, or, you know, Tatiova life gain in the command zone. Things of that nature where they kind of deal with aggro in those capacities. So I actually think mid range and control are stronger against combo than aggro is just because they have those long games and the tools to deal with those early combo win attempts if they're playing you know their snuff outs and their lightning and for for those of you watching this that uh, uh aren't familiar so this this taps in directly to the conversation that's being held right now in the in the in the internet forums right uh in the discords as it were uh we're trying to discover like uh uh the aggro player, the aggro player attacking combo is the correct thing to do. Uh, that has been said for a number of months now, probably closer to a year now. And uh, we make these assertions as players, as communities, and we're testing the validity of those assertions now. And what Dallas is appropriately saying is that uh, maybe those assertions are incorrect, and we're starting to recognize that. Uh, the data is showing that people still believe that aggro is the hedge. That's my assumption is that aggro is the hedge to combo because as combo grows, aggro grows as well. But maybe the real answer is uh, playing these now mid range has a fast mid range, mid mid range and a slow mid range. So I'm going to tend towards the faster uh, mid mid range lists that are out there. So uh, as the faster combo decks start to set up, these 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 faster mid range decks need to have that that uh, removal or inter interaction available 
earlier so that way they're interacting in the first few turns then setting up their board state so that way you're essentially time walking the combo player and then setting up your board state to be able to finish them off uh a lot of us are starting to feel like that's probably a more appropriate uh tack on uh, how these games should be playing out as far as pod composition of course we can't we can't prove it. Now, the way the aggro player fits into that is they probably should be attacking the mid-range player while they're handling the combo player. But once again, this is all speculation and hot takes. So Yeah, and uh, that being said, I do want to point out that aggro decks are still a problem for combo decks, especially if they choose to target the combo deck first. But in my experience, if the aggro deck targets the combo deck first, then they are not very likely to win the game. So they might kill the combo player, but that doesn't mean that it was the right choice. They take <laughs> they kill two players, themselves and the combo player. <laughs> um, additionally, part of the reason that combo could be doing well, if it is true that control is the best answer or those slow or some of those mid-range decks are the best answer to combo, is the fact that their control is hardly represented at all, and mid-range has actually dropped in popularity, I believe, yeah, substantially, um, due to time constraints and things of that kind, which can actually just help combo, because, you know, their natural counters can't win in those time frames, potentially. So that can just snowball the combo to popularity be and all that. Yeah, to be <laughs> yeah. determined. Yeah, because we're still we're in the middle of all of it. So here, yeah. here by August, we'll probably have a, a more clearer view of the outcome of uh, the effect of time on deck selection, game percentage wins, you know, all that stuff. So uh, to be that, yes. to be continued. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But colors. Yeah, um, Color time. Uh, so we actually have Azorius uh, at the top of the winning by a substantial margin, Six with uh, almost a nine percent win rate or winningness percentage, not win rate, uh, <laughs> winningness over the uh, seven point five percent popularity. Um, what Azorius decks are being played? Do you know, Clay? Um, um is it uh, Gretchen? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, no, uh, yeah, Gretchen uh, is saying I know better. Um, Adele, yeah. <laughs> I was trying Adele. to give you an answer that you would like, Daddy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, okay. Abdel. Civic, 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 okay, but yeah, uh, yeah. Abdel, yeah, yeah. Abdel. Abdel, yeah, blue. So, uh, what are the two blue? One is a uh, Sorkos Sailor. What's and the other candle keep, not candle keep. That one's banned. Um, the uh, I don't even know what it's called. The dungeon one and oh, Feywild yeah, yeah, Trickster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I've so, actually seen all of them. So um, I, yeah, I don't know. The reason why I bring that up is I don't know which combinations are contributing to what percentage. You know, of what part of this percentage? It's likely that uh, since Sword Coast Sailor is the uh, default. You know. I don't know what the other two backgrounds contribute in in, in game plan that differ from Sword Coast Sailor. Um, and the reason why they pick Sword Coast Sailor is uh, it gives you uh, plan D of being able to attack with Abdel and not be blocked. So you have a commander damage plan in uh, as plan X, you know, in yeah. Sword Coast Sailor. So some assumptions so there, yeah. Not only that, but it's also the cheapest one mana wise, which means if you put it into play, it can make soldiers with Abdel if you're absolutely needing that. The other two, there's one that lets you venture into the dungeon an additional time whenever you do that. So if you're playing a more mid rangey deck or playing all of those venture things and you want to use it as a win condition, things of that nature, you can play that one. And the other one makes tokens whenever non tokens deal damage from your side. So that one helps you build up more of a board, but Abdel already does that pretty well on its own. And Abdel has to be in play for those backgrounds to do anything. So that one doesn't see as much play. It's mostly just Sword Coast for the reasons you've mentioned. 
But uh, yeah, uh, we have some more mono color uh, doing strong. Uh, the next four colors are actually blue, black, green, and white. So all the mono color stuff doing pretty well currently. Um, we talked about it a bit. There are three mono color decks in the meta share. A lot of those decks coming up, not having to play those tap lands, like you mentioned. Um, being very linear, typically, uh, most monocolor decks, but pretty efficient and fairly effective. Typically, if you're going to play a monocolor deck, you probably have a very strong command zone mm -hmm. to make up for the fact that you don't have those colors. Mm -hmm. So, pretty self-explanatory as to what the goal is there. And uh, Simic being very strongly represented um, in the popularity but winning about what you would expect it to. Yeah, uh, then we can go on to the decks, or not decks, the colors that are underperforming. Um, we still see Rakdos not doing well currently, along with Mono Red, um, kind of just underperforming, not being very large percentages of the meta. Well, so red decks, yeah. But yeah, uh, Mono Red, kind of surprising to me to see down here with decks like Targo Kedis. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they just get hated out of the game. Sometimes they just can't get there, you know? Um, especially if there's uh, uh, a high number of combo decks, some of those uh, Mono Red decks can struggle because they tend to be aggressive in nature and potentially not able to finish off multiple combo decks without the help of another aggro or mid-range deck. Um, one that surprised me to see down here is is it mm -hmm. at, at almost a 19% popularity um, underperforming. Mm -hmm. uh, I think part of this is probably a lot of people picking up uh, red Malcolm decks um, for tournament preparation and things of that nature and just learning the decks, um, I think Malcolm Red is still busted. So. Yeah, so, like, into that, uh, to, to drill down deeper on that, uh, this data captures, anytime they log a game that has uh, an experimental brew, uh, it might not be their final iteration, so they're basically working on cards, you know, exploring different uh, options that are available to them in those colors, and uh, sometimes those... Uh, those theoretical things work out. Sometimes they don't, and whether or not it contributes to the the, the loss or not, you know, uh, all these all these things are considerations. So basically, people are just you know iterating through their list and trying to see what works. And we're going to capture all of that. So does that mean that uh, uh, even though is it's popular that it sucks? No, that's not what that means. Yeah, and what's really interesting to see is it uh, having a bad winningness percentage here is the fact that we have uh, two Malcolm decks in the meta share, two is it Malcolm decks, and one is it Malcolm deck in the fringe category. So the Malcolm decks are actually doing pretty well. So I'd have to look into what the other is it decks being played are, but apparently there have been uh, some other is it decks that have not been doing well to uh, drive the well, winningness Guild Mage, down. Guild Mage is probably in that category as the most popular one. Um... Yeah, I would assume Guild Mage is up there, but I don't know what else would be off the top of my head, at least. Anything else on yeah. colors? I find uh, the one interesting thing that I find about the colors is the colorless. That's probably one or two uh, data points there, but uh, it just basically shows that people are still trying new things. So that's important, and I wanted to point that out. Yeah, people are trying to play colorless. Uh, I don't think it's good. Uh, I don't think we have a commander that's strong enough to make up for having no colors mm -hmm. in colorless currently. But, you know, people are still trying it. Uh, it's a fun experiment, at the least. No doubt. So, All right, then. But yeah. Conclusion. You want to take away the conclusion, or do you want me to go through this no, one? I can, uh, I can go through it. Um, All right. So, what Bodarn puts in here is his opinion. In my humble opinion, uh, the meta is fast-paced, combo-based, and homogenous. Uh, so the the part the where the fast pace comes in hasn't been revealed yet, uh, and that's in the reduction of the uh, the average number of turns between quarters, uh, which I can't recall off the top of my head, but we'll get to it 
so uh, the natural boogeyman being Abdel Sorko Sailor, 20 games, 75 win percent win percentage. So that is, I don't know what the, I don't want to dissuade or uh, I don't want to disparage anyone else who's piloted to the deck, but uh, I think it's probably agreeable that uh, Chris is, has the lion's share of uh, that data. So uh, what we have is a, an, an outstanding pilot with an outstanding list that could be tailored to him. You could make the argument that he's picking cards based on his own preferences and stuff like that. But uh, to that end, um, it shows the, it illustrates the power of uh, a selection of cards for a specific pilot uh, and under those circumstances having a, a higher than average win percent, right? So next, uh, next best. So Loyal Subordinate is an interesting, uh, I just played it uh, for the first time yesterday and I'm, I'm in love, right? It's, it's basically, uh, who would have known that there's a bunch of, uh, ETB, LTB, uh, other tap related stuff in black that, that says something to the effect of uh, each opponent uh, loses, you know, X number of life and you gain X number of life. So just by just by playing a card on ETB, you can, you know, affect the board and create a, a deference in life total just by playing magic or attacking, which this is an aggro deck. So attacking and then people have the choice of just taking one damage or taking two life, you know? So, uh, it's what I'm, what I'm getting at is it's such an interesting concept that has yet to be, have, have yet to be seen, uh, that, uh, uh, I would say that between it being good and between it being a previous unknown, it has a, dis a disparate, you know, like a effect on the, uh, uh, on the, on the meta. So people aren't, haven't learned to engage with it properly yet. So it's uh, it's a com a mixture of all of those things together. You have anything on subordinate? Um, I think I've said what I need to about the deck. It's good. Uh, it's very linear, very streamlined. Like we've mentioned, doesn't have to play tapped lands. Gets to play mm -hmm. all the rituals and stuff. Um, I think at this point, people should stop playing tapped lands as much as possible anyways. Especially in two color decks, I think Gretchen is on three, mm -hmm. um, maybe four, and that's not that's more than I want. But I'm very, Gretchen has I'm very uses happy to for hear them. this. Yeah, I've been uh, um, I've been saying this for a year. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think my Liara deck has been on one tapped land mm -hmm. since I built the deck. Um, just. It's there's too many. There's too many ways, uh, especially with uh, artifact based decks. Uh, there's too many mm -hmm. ways to filter colors. So, like even even certain lands, uh, like uh, there's one that uh, Jonathan was just talking about uh, uh, yesterday. It uh, ETB scries and then uh, produces a colorless, and then also has the uh, the filter pay one uh, filter ability on it, uh, which in this current context is really strong because you're getting Card advantage in a free slot. Uh, uh, Crystal Grotto. I Crystal think. Grotto. Yep. So you're getting card advantage in a, uh, uh, a free slot, and then the ability to play more than one color. Because really, having a land or two that taps for colorless doesn't isn't a detriment uh, to your overall game plan because of uh, the way pips work out. So, uh, yeah, play play less tap lands, guaranteed. <laughs> so. Uh, the meta information here that's been on your screen while we've been talking is basically a, uh, a combination of what we've talked about previously between quarters. Uh, surprise, surprise, you're going to see some of the same all-stars, Abdel, Sword Coast Sailor, Little Subordinate, Scholar of the Ages, uh, Malcolm X, uh, Avalanche Caller, and Gut. Um, uh, yeah, this is just the uh, the data from quarter two. Oh, this just the data the... Yeah, this is just all of the... It's oh, the sorry. exact same thing. Okay, so he's repeating it? Okay. Yeah, that's the meta from quarter two. So, right here. The average number of turns per game has decreased from 10.27 to 9.27. We have lost a turn 
Now, granted, once again, we're comparing a full quarter of uh, data to a partial quarter of data. Uh, what would you say? Uh, how much of June do we have left at this point in time? You know, like uh, half. So, so we're missing maybe uh, 15, a couple weeks of data. Fifteen percent difference, maybe. Yeah, something like that. So it's possible in the next two weeks that we could be adding games to the to the data that uh, offset this. Uh, so it won't be as salacious as this, and we'll have to circle back at a later time. <laughs> but you know, with two weeks to go, we're losing a full turn. That is significant. Now we were talking earlier about the effects of combo on the meta what we perceive the the reality of what mid range could be in the meta and how that gets translated as as it interacts directly with combo like losing a full turn in a mid range deck that really affects your game plan when you're putting together your rilsa or insert you know any other uh uh what's the what's the new horse shadow facts when you know like like these these numbers here, this is the reason why we started the whole turns uh, study so, many, so long ago, was to determine exactly this. How much time do you have on average? And if the combo decks are, are leveraging this, this time, right, then every other, uh, obviously, every other uh, archetype needs to be leveraging this time as well. So losing a turn, I feel, if this turns out to be true after the next two weeks, big impacts big big things like can you imagine uh like you remember where we started what was that uh, <laughs> 15 to 20 turns and then that, that got stupid. and then that um, got reduced to 14 and then that got reduced to 12 and then that got reduced to 10 and we've been hovering around 10 ish for probably six months prior yeah so in my experience, um, playing in tournament pods with the absolute, what is considered, or what I'd consider some of the top decks of the format, mm -hmm. I think you need to be ready with your value engine for presenting a win. Turn 7 at the latest, and then these turn 8, 9, 10, 11, is whenever the first person doesn't just win. Those are the games where there's a ton of interaction and it takes longer. So I'd actually expect this to drop even further, um, which is crazy to say, I know. But yeah, uh, I'd expect this to go lower. Well, this is a, a fantastic sell selling point for uh, all of you CEDH expats out there that are, are looking for a competitive format. Uh, that doesn't have all of the, what to say, hubbub of what CPDA or CEDH looks like uh, the last year or so. Uh, we'll just, I think that describes it pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for an exciting environment where you get to play your competitive whatever, uh, you don't have fast mana, so there's a, an a automatic equalizer there. It's a Brewer's Haven still. Still, it's a Brewer's Haven. And we're showing that uh, there's power in these common cards because we are consistently, through our efforts, dropping this this turn order thing, which is going to make things very interesting for the rest of the year, I think. So, yeah, I, I wanted to... This is no small thing, so that's why, that's why I wanted to spend some time specifically delving uh, or talking to the... Uh, and waiting for the turn order uh, conversation. So uh, obviously the second part of the sentence here on the screen is uh, shows the increase in popularity of combo uh, uh, over the last two quarters. Uh, I would attribute that uh, popularity because of uh, uh, the time constraints in tournament settings. People are uh, wanting to respect that, and this is how I feel they're perceiving to respect that. Now the the the, the whiplash effect that I think is going to happen to this. So this tournament prep. Uh, period has developed these really, really strong combo decks, and I think those are always going to be at that level. So I think what's going to happen is as these uh, in the off season, these slower meta decks 
are going to adapt. And I think there's going to be a rubber band like whiplash effect where some of these slower mid range decks become faster mid range decks and X, Y, Z. So I think that overall and kind of lending to what you were saying earlier about the, the, the turn order number going down, uh, I think these faster combo decks are a net positive because the way they're going to affect the rest of the meta. So yeah, that's true. And uh, that's true. Not only in magic, but I play like basically every TCG under the sun and in every card game, essentially anytime there is a rotation or new set comes out or anything of that kind, the extremely linear fast decks which in our format is mostly combo and aggro decks, are taking up a larger portion of the meta share. They're winning more because they're just easy to learn. So as people are getting ready for tournament prep and learning this essentially almost a new format with the same cards, they're going to lean more on these things. Whereas the mid-range and control decks naturally take longer to actually become relevant because they have to tailor their game plan around the other decks at the table. Whereas combo and aggro just are more focused on enforcing their game plan and forcing other people to answer it. So there needs to be a meta truly developed for control to really shine in the first place, because it has to know what threats to answer and how to answer them. So I've got on the screen now, which uh, I don't have a uh, broadcast for, for Dallas to look at, so I apologize. Uh, so <laughs> at the end of this uh, text document that will be included in the description, uh, uh, Bodarn includes a, uh, a nice little TLDR and just kind of highlighting a couple of items in that. We've already talked about average number of terms, top performers, uh, the archetypes most popular. Um, there's a couple of points of data that uh, the last three items here. The observed number of unique colors has decreased from 23 to 18. So once again, I'm not much of a colors guy, but I assume that to be related to uh, tournament prep. So people are getting away from exploration and getting more honed in their uh, uh, in their efforts to perfect a certain deck, um, which is also reflected in the next thing of uh, the observed number of unique decks has decreased from 170 to 124. Once again, you know, you're going to be less, less likely to experiment with new things when you're trying to focus on uh, getting something ready for, for tournament. And then uh, right now, now remember, incomplete uh, versus complete quarter, uh, the number of reported games has decreased from 209 to 112. Now, the reason why I wanted to read this one out loud again is uh, we've had Player activity cycle uh, from various parts of the year. So, like, uh, May was probably a very difficult time for Dallas because he was working on the end of school and uh, getting all that stuff, you know, preparing for the end of the semester at the beginning. I don't know when the, be uh, the end of the semester is for you, but either the end of May or beginning of June for every college student is tough because you got finals, you got uh, all this other crap if you're not graduating, you know, that you got to deal with. So we go through a, uh, uh, a downturn in participation during opportunities like that. The same is true for August, September, when school starts up again. Uh, you know, we, we experience a downturn, especially uh, going from cold to, to hot weather. You know, like uh, um, we, where I'm at, we get a lot of snow. So like my participation inside is pretty good during the winter time because <laughs> I don't want to be outside. So we're going to have an uptick in activity. And then when it gets warmer, we're going to have a downturn in activity. So like uh, all of these things come into play when we're talking about the ebbs and flows of availability and players, you know, uh, tournaments are going to add a, a new complication to that cycle. And as the format grows, sure. I think it'll even out uh, some because you'll have, uh, you know, just the natural balance there. But uh you, I wanted to ask you before I transition away, I'm going to put us uh, our faces back on the screen. Do you have uh, anything left in the data that you wanted to uh, point to before I transition screens? I think we covered everything I wanted to bring up. Sweet. Okay, so we'll go back. Now it's just us. 
All right. So this was an interesting case study. Now, of course, once again, the, uh, the data is incomplete by two weeks, but uh, sacrifices had to be made uh, to be able to pre present something to you before RIW, get our impressions, our takes, our feels, and all that stuff that provides an opportunity and time to uh, reflect on that post RIW, probably post uh, the next Sanctuary Tournament in July, which I, I think is like, you know, in the middle of the month sometime. I can't remember the date exactly. Uh, but, you know, we've got some things coming up that uh, doing this now gives us the opportunity to compare and contrast because that's really where uh, truths in the analysis come out is uh, having these hot takes and then being wrong about them. Or <laughs> uh, regarding tap lands, I'll take credit for that. <laughs> so um, to that end, I, I hope that you find this uh, enjoyable. I hope that uh, you, you got some value out of this. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, I got something wrong. Dallas never gets anything wrong, so you don't worry about never. making comments. any comments. Yeah, uh, don't if, watch the, the comment theory episode where we guess what's coming to the uh, sanctuary tournament. No doubt. So uh, <laughs> to that to that end, um, uh, Dallas is the uh, the server admin for the dot guide along with myself. Dot guide uh, Discord server. Of course, you can interact with us in there. Uh, we have that set up. Uh, not to be a, a, a cultural place like some of these other servers are. It's basically set up in the same way that the Moxfield and the Scryfall servers are set up. There's some magic conversation that happens in those, but you know, it basically serves as a, uh, a, a nexus for uh, resolving and you know talking to the community about what they're seeing uh, in the website and in the data and that sort of thing and answering those questions. I mean, yes, there's been some brewery discussions, but basically just a, it's an opportunity for uh, us to streamline that communication line. So that way we're not working through DMS and all of that. So um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm going to post the link to this video in the, uh, the, the data analysis channel. Uh, we can interact further there by all means uh, do that. You can also tell us where incorrect and timestamp, uh, your your criticism is not valid unless you timestamp. So uh, timestamp, you know, hey, you said X Y Z at this point. What do you mean? Uh, uh, you know, I think this. By all means, let us have it. Both barrels. So we're both grown up. So uh, to that end, the Dallas, are you are you still doing your puzzle box YouTube? Yeah, I don't post on there very often, but what I think is something I can do on my own, yeah. <laughs> right on. So primarily, uh, Dallas is in Common Theory. Once again, link in the bottom there. Uh, you can find him in every single Discord, I think, that uh, talks about uh, Competitive Popper Commander and probably some other Discords as well. Um, what's your Twitter handle offhand? Uh, Puzzlebox DC, I think. Righteous, I think, too. <laughs> so uh yeah go find go find him in places where he does things uh he produces outstanding products uh him and his uh cohort chris uh i think you're also on the hook to commentate the next sanctuary thing or is that uh probably hopefully uh as long as we get enough players i'll i'll be doing commentary so sign up to play uh, tournaments no excuse don't make me play again don't make him play yeah, him and him and Chris. Let somebody let somebody else win. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> they came in to uh, help support the community and actually fill out the pods. And we're actually grateful that they did because that would have made uh, uh, pod breakdowns really uh, awkward. So they uh, proof right there in the pudding that they're they're here to support us. So. All right. To that end. This one was a good one. It was a. Uh, Hour and twenty minutes, so until the next time. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs>